So thank you, everyone. I'm Jacob. Uh, I'll be talking about avoiding the basilisk fangs, state of the art in AI LLM text detection. Just kidding. I'm actually going to be talking about Dinosaur Ranching 101 in search of the elusive NFT Rex. I was up for hours last night coming up with NFT Rex, so uh, I hope you do appreciate it. If you're not laughing, you weren't there last night. I'm sorry. You're never going to get that back. No recordings, I hope. Uh, so we'll just jump right into it. First of all, what's in a name? I uh, don't know if anyone has heard of Rocco's Basilisk. It's essentially someone posted online saying maybe down the future some super AI is going to come and then it's going to torture people who did not help come about its supremacy. And so that's where the basilisk came from. Uh, this is apparently how Elon Musk and Grimes got together because they made a joke of Rococo basilisk, which is like the fancy Marianne Antoinette. Uh, so... Basically, the basilisk stare is deadly. It also has fangs. Here's a picture of it from Harry Potter if you haven't seen it. Uh, so my hope is, is that if we can detect AI-generated content, we can then start to contextualize it. We can understand what it's doing. We can understand the motivations behind it, or more likely the users that are using it. And then maybe we can defend ourselves. And then from that, there is no more reference to basilisks whatsoever. So the obscure reference is now done. Real quick, uh, I work for Thinks. They do canaries. Um, I would just want to plug one thing here is Thinkscapes. Every quarter we review between two and 7,000 blog posts, talks, papers. We pick the ones that we think are either brand new or seeing kind of a coalescing and increase in momentum in some research field. We summarize them and we pull out trends and then we give all that away for free. So if you don't have time to go to the average of four conferences happening every day of the year, you can use us to help you go through that and kind of pick out the signal from the noise. Um, so thinks.com slash TS. Oh. I have no formal AI ML background. I used to be a DARPA program manager, and I did run one AI program there, but I don't really have the formal training in this. So a lot of this is just me learning over the last couple of years about this. Um, I do live in Colorado. The humidity here is brutal, um, and uh, I did get to fly an F-16 one day for work, so that was pretty sweet. Just some terminology here. I'll leave this up just for a second and kind of just go through. Most of these things should be well known. Hopefully, you know what an LLM is. If not, where have you been this last year? Hopefully, you know what generative AI is. If not, where have you been this last year? Hopefully, you know what compression is. Um, really, the only one which I'm going to talk about a little bit later is a rock curve, which is some strange thing meant for radio communications and radar. Uh, but it's been used in machine learning classification to kind of map out the sensitivity of a detector or a classifier. So I don't know if you guys have heard about these LLMs, things like ChatGPT. They've created a lot of hype. They've been in the news occasionally, if you know where to look, like anywhere. Um, and I think what happened was is GPT-2 to GPT-3 to ChatGPT was kind of this, this watershed moment. Essentially, they jumped what we call the uncanny valley, where it went from creepy, bizarre, and nonsensical text to something that now is convincing and scary, and it kind of opened this, you know, collective delusion that we're now in this, you know, either the end of the world is coming because an AI is going to ruin it, or the next phase of humanity, if you listen to Mark Andreessen, and we're about to unlock our potential as, as near gods. Um, and really what happened here is that the amount of training data got really big, and the amount of compute got really big. Uh, so GPT-3, which is now old technology, uh, was 175 billion parameters. So essentially, they're taking their input, they're lifting it up to 175 billion dimensional mathematical space, and then they're operating in that space, and then they're condensing it back down. So that's enormous, and that's old and small and whatever. Um, so... Hype aside from LLMs, they really have done some amazing things, right? You can scale realistic text generation. AI-generated images are mostly okay now. There's only a few people with 11 fingers or fingers coming out of their fingers, if you've seen some of those creepy dolly pictures. Um, but they really, you know, they do have a lot of purposes. Some are great. Some are not so great. Um, and I think realistically, you know, the prompt defenses that people like OpenAI have put in to try to prevent you from, say, getting a recipe for napalm, 
they're just not going to work at scale. There are papers out there showing that essentially they can always find a way to break out of that kind of containment and do something that's considered dangerous. So we have to live with these things, but we don't have a way to secure them yet. And so our hope is, is that maybe with this technology, we'd at least be able to know if we're being told something by a human or by an LLM. Um, and I think just the most important part of LLM, the first L is for large, and so we have that there, 175 billion parameters, that's pretty big. Uh, and then the next L is for language. And so their language models, they don't understand the underlying concepts that they're explaining. They just understand, you know, given some input tokens, what are the most likely output tokens following that? And so that's very important, and I think that's the core of how we can do the detection. Um, they need a huge amount of training data, and we've almost exhausted that, right? So GPT-3, again, this is old. This is so last year. 45 terabytes of text all had to be human-generated. They find that if you train it on AI-generated text, very quickly the performance drops off. Um, this actually triggered Reddit's implosion. I'm not sure if anyone was following that earlier this year. Essentially, Reddit said, we want to start charging for people to read Reddit if you use a third-party app because people are scraping us and then we're losing all this revenue. And so that was because Reddit was a source of human-generated content. And so it's having these strange knock-on effects. For a while, uh, I guess it's X-Twitter, whatever it's called now, Zitter, um, they had made it so that you couldn't read without being logged in, again, to stop people from scraping. Um, and when you look at these mantles, they're very careful to prevent overfitting. So they used all of Wikipedia when they were training these transformer models, but then they made sure to exclude Wikipedia from the common crawl scrapes of the internet at large to make sure that they weren't overfit to that source. And so this is where I think we start to get kind of this intuition where Essentially, because they're trained on so much text, they are the most average person in terms of their conversation. They are the, they're reverting to the mean. What is the average person going to say given these texts? And then there's this temperature setting, which essentially is how far does it deviate from the most likely next token? Um, and so I think that this reversion may be that, that key to text detection and then also possibly attribution. Um, so we'll go a quick aside. Uh, so Kolmogorov complexity is basically this uncomputable measure of information entropy. How small of a program could you write that generates something? So the letter A 1,000 times is pretty easy. Just print A 1,000 times. A 1,000 character random string is going to be much more difficult, so it's more complex. Very similar to that and related is perplexity, which essentially, given the preceding tokens and this current token that you're reading, or current word, how surprised are you by that? How likely was that generated based on the preceding input context? So if it has low probability generated, that would be a higher perplexity. If you hear the quick brown slug, you're like, wait a second, slugs are not quick. They are brown, but not quick. And so more perplexity is more surprise. So when you see that word, just say, I'm surprised, I'm perplexed. And so the general thought behind my detection is that humans generate bigger perplexity scores that's still coherent because we understand the concepts we're talking about. We also have unique linguistic features. We all have a different education. You know, English is my first language not all of yours, and so we have different backgrounds, we have different vocab choice, we have different linguistic styles, and that uniqueness and our intelligence to understand what we're talking about, or at least pretend that we understand what we're talking about, is the signature of being human that we're going to exploit to detect LLM versus human text. Just a quick example, uh, this is uh, GPT 3.5, this is ChatGPT. I just turned up the temperature, so it's uh, you know very perplexing. This text is very high temperature, very high perplexity. Um, you know, I also think that Kobe calling Glasgow simulator available is a great thing to eat with cheese. So this is the current state of the art. Uh, another one for those of you who live here. Um, here are 10 fun things you can do in Luxembourg. I have never been to the pounded faculty generation cell utilized use Mac Africa loader variant, but maybe I will do that later today. Again, very high perplexity, incoherent. Our intuition is generated text from an LLM must walk this knife edge, and I apologize that the knife is very blunt there, it's more like a pyramid, of being too predictable, which then is very easy to catch, because it's low perplexity and it doesn't make sense coming from a human, 
or to random, which is also very easy for us to catch. And I'm not sure how well you can see, but basically the, uh, the color on the left there, that's text that's being highlighted by, you know, the chances of that word being generated by with the preceding context. And so green means that's the most likely term you're going to see. So for the most part, that text is very low perplexity and it jumps out and very early detectors like glitter, that is how they catch text. On the other side, you have very high perplexity text that doesn't understand things and very quickly it's meaningless exactly like this. So that's the knife edge that LLMs have to be able to walk. So they're playing in this game of how much can I jump out and be random, but how quickly can I stop being meaningless? So my argument is if we can estimate perplexity, can we at least relatively accurately detect AI-generated text? There are tools that do this. I am not the first person to do this. I am not going to be the last person to do this. So OpenAI, for example, had an LLM detector. It's not ChatGPT. If you say, ChatGPT, did you generate this? It will just lie to you. And it says it will lie to you. They had a specific detector based on one of their underlying models. They pulled it out for a while, which is actually great. I found it had 62% accuracy, so it was one of the worst performing ones. Also, it's not their business model to then undo what their main bread and butter is, which is selling ChatGPT. So they pulled it saying it was an impossible problem. Uh, Glitter, which I mentioned, used GPT-2 instead of trying to generate text to use its probability metrics to determine perplexity. GPT-0, Crossplag, many others are doing this with a GPT-based model. Uh, Meta has a Roberta model that can detect using GPT-2. So that's kind of the way that we do this, is we're using this intuition of high perplexity, more human, low perplexity, more AI. And the question is, is how do you know what's most probable given context? And that requires a many billion parameter model. Or does it? And that's the open question that I came to with Zippy. So Zippy is a tool to detect, and also I am having early research showing that can attribute which model generated the text without a very expensive model. It's orders of magnitude faster than all of the other ones. Uh, so it is based on compression. People here have probably heard of compression. The algorithm that I used in Python is actually older than I am, so it's, uh, it's not a novel concept. And it's actually been used as a quick machine learning kind of anomaly detector for years. There are papers where they would just feed in network logs to a, a compressor, and whenever the compression ratio started getting worse, they start paying attention because that's something that they haven't seen before. They haven't seen those tokens. They haven't been able to compress very well. So anomalies are surprises. What else is surprising? Perplexity. So the question is, is could you estimate perplexity using compression? That would be way faster, way smaller, very easy to modify. And so the simple concept, which is like 160 lines of code, is you have a bunch of text being relative. You compress it, score the comp uh, compression ratio. You then append that sample that you want to test. Is this LLM generator or not? If the compression ratio improves, which means it's very similar to the text that's already seen generated, it's probably or possibly LLM generated. The opposite, if it's now very surprising and the compression is terrible, maybe that's more likely something that is human generated, as long as it makes sense. If you put random data in it, it's going to compress terribly, and it's going to say it's human generated, but it's obviously just random data. And then the name, again, I have to have some goofy name. So I'm using originally LZMA compression, which is used by Zip, and it was first implemented in Python, and it's fast, hence Zippy. So real quick, this is the very simple design because it's very simple. You can go and download the code. It's all open source. Uh, essentially, we start off by you know having some corpus of LLM generated text, which is the, the model. Uh, roughly around 200 kilobytes seems to be just fine. Um, and then we compress that and we save the compression ratio. Then we take that model, we append whatever sample we want to detect on, we compress that. And if the compression ratio improves, LLM, if it decreases, human, and then we kind of use that as a confidence score by how much it's changed. And so that's our very simple way to start scoring that. Uh, I mean, this is just me running a command line tool. You can all check it out and do it yourself. But basically, you can either give it sample files, you can give it um, 
uh, just text as something that you pipe things to. You can choose the different compression algorithms. I'm working on ensembling them to kind of get a consensus between them. And so this is something that I wrote just to test. It's about me. Um, you know, I live in Colorado and it shows up as human generated. And then if you run the same thing where you ask ChatGPT to say, tell me something about me, I'm a guy. And then it says, here's a guy. Uh, it shows up as AI generated. So it works kind of how you expect. Not trying to be difficult. Um, trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, so it's still an ongoing research effort. Uh, there's still some open questions um, about things like scalability. How well does it work if you put another language in there or you try to make your model multilingual or you try to do it for code versus human text? Um, don't know yet. Uh, the compression algorithm, we tried LZMA, Zlib, and Brotly. Uh, so far, they're pretty much neck and neck. Um, and I actually have some interesting results on how you, when you turn the knob on more compression, more time versus less compression, less time, um, they kind of tweak a little bit. Um, and then also we have these early results where you can not only say, is this AI generated or not? You could say, that's probably from Bard, or that's Vacuna, or that's ChatGPT, because they each have that kind of reversion to a different mean. Um, and so this is very simple. You just have a text of ChatGPT text, Bard text, et cetera. And then the best compression ratio improvement is most likely the model. Same thing, except you just have you know, multiple files you're compressing. So the big question is, is how do you evaluate a detector, right? Uh, there's a lot of bad data out there. Um, so the most data sets that are out there are from GPT-2. Um, they're not all very well curated. Um, and so there are a lot of them also not prompted. Because there's a lot of work to write a prompt and evaluate the data set to make sure it's coming back as something that's sensical to humans. So this is an example from the GPT-2 data set that OpenAI publishes. If you look at that, you don't really think that that's human generated anyways. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But, you know, again, that's going to be very perplexing and very surprising. And then you're going to end up saying that's more human. So that's very difficult. Um, also, there's a lot of human data in very specific formats. Uh, so one of the data sets I found, Mask, is basically a collection of pre-AI text, specifically from the U.S., but a lot of it's letters to the editor, which is kind of overly formal. Dear sir or dear editor, I have to complain about X, Y, Z. Um, those types of things is not how people talk. So it's an interesting kind of bias that's implicit in the data sets. And then also trusting data sets. You know, if you use Wikipedia as a human generated source, how much of that is human generated? Do you have to discard everything from, you know, the last year, the last two years? Um, so how are they tainted? Uh, and then also another thing of the evaluation of comparing something like Zippy to another tool is that they are, uh, you know, they're commercial services. So you have to sometimes pay to use them, which is tedious. Uh, and then also they change behind the scenes. So OpenAI was actively developing their detector as they were building it. And so that means I'd run something and I get a score. And then a week later, they'd say, oh, that's that's done. That's bad. We have a new model now. And you rerun it again, which takes hours and hours, and then you get a new result. Um, and then the, the landscape as well. Like Since I submitted this talk not that long ago, OpenAI has pulled their detector. There are new ones in there. Um, there's actually one now that finally beats Zippy. Um, so it's a constant landscape. There's not very much transparency and evaluation, which I think is very harmful because a lot of these sites say, they may not necessarily go out and say it, but they are selling a service that is used by, say, teachers or professors to then check their students' work. And then people have gotten zeros or failed classes because of that. And so that's something that's concerning if you don't have transparency in how something works. Do you have a question? Okay. You want to ask it right now or do you? Okay. Okay. I'm not yet concluding. Okay. So there are some data sets I was able to find. I manually prompted ChatGPT, Bing, Bard, and Vacuna. Um, there is an open AI unprompted data set of GPT-3, which essentially just kind of comes out like verbal diarrhea. Same thing with GPT-2. Um, there are some works looking specifically at academic abstracts, um, where you ask either GPT-2 or ChatGPT to give in a title and some keywords from an IEEE paper, write an abstract for that. 
Uh, and then you take that abstract and you go to ChatGPT again and say, here's this abstract I wrote. Can you improve that? And then I will give myself N tokens to tweak and change it to improve it. So now you have something that's co-written. That's the, the cheat data set, which I think is really representative of the types of things that we'll be facing, right? There's raw GPT generated text. There's GPT summarized, improved, revised, and then there's the human AI teaming, which is obviously the most difficult to detect because it has some elements of humanity in it. Um, on the human generated side, I use some news stories that either uh, should come from a reputable source. There's this mask 500,000 data set, which is essentially you know, old American letters to the editor and emails and other things that have been made public record from early 2000s, late 90s, uh, and then human-written abstracts from IEEE and other scientific journals that hopefully haven't been all generated by ChatGPT. Um, the two that I asterisk are unprompted. Their output is not believable at all. It's seemingly random, um, and obviously that means Zippy's performance is correspondingly very poor. So here's the results. Uh, I will kind of just explain the chart. So for those of you who don't see, the ideal detector would be similar to the kind of orangey line, which is kind of like an inverted L. It should go straight up and then straight over. And that means the area under the curve is 100%. The dashed line is just random guessing with the same amount of confidence. That's 50%. So if you're doing below that line, you're doing something very wrong. You're more wrong than you are right. Um, and so uh, area under the curve in this rock curve, uh, it's more dependent on the scores you give. So a high confidence bad score will do worse than a low confidence bad score. And so there's a slight deviation, differi uh, difference between the actual accuracy as we would think about it. Like you gave me this text, I said it was human generated, it was actually LLM generated, that's fail versus oh, you told me that that was AI generated with a very high confidence, but really it was human generated with a very low confidence. So those types of things is a little bit of a difference. That's why you see the difference in like the percent accuracy, which is what we think of as pass fail versus the area under the curve. The nice thing was when these change, it means you can tweak by a constant to kind of get them into alignment. So there's a little bit more improvement that can be gotten for almost all of these. Uh, so you'll see that um, it's pretty good. So Zippy is the blue line. Um, and so we're at 80% accuracy with no tweaking, 86% area under the curve. So better than guessing for sure. Um, I'll give you a reminder that OpenAI's model was 62% accurate. So down below, you know, GPT-0, Crossplag. Um, Roberta's open model, that's the one that is uh, available uh, on a hugging face. That's pretty good. Um, it's very good. And then, sadly, the best one is Content at Scale. Uh, content at Scale just released this, and they are the only ones that are beating us. And sadly, Content at Scale is an SEO content generation company. So they face an existential threat if Google or Bing marks their text as AI generated, because they will then discount that website as being part of their page rank algorithm. So what they do is they sell you a service of, you have some dinosaur ranch you want to advertise, or some chickens you want to advertise. Uh, they will go and they'll write lots of fake artificial blogs. They'll post them all over the internet that I'll link to you, and then that will make your chicken dinosaur ranch elevated in search terms. So they also have a detector to make sure that the text they're generating is not flagged as LLM drivel, because that is what Google will immediately throw out. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty good. It kind of makes sense. OpenAI pulled their detector because they were slightly better than guessing. Um, but it does need a standardized evaluation. Um, and I think also what's, what's open is how do you engineer your prompts to maybe bypass this approach. So when I first did this, uh, my boss Haroon said, you know, what happens if you say, answer this question, but in the voice of a high school student or in the voice of Sherlock Holmes, you know, that is enough outside of the deviation of what's normal that that started fooling my detector. So I went through a couple examples, you know, had them write an essay in the high school or a college student voice, throw that in the model and very quickly it got much more accurate at those types of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say ChatGPT is the best out there. Uh, if you ask 
Bing or Bard write an essay in the voice of a college student, all they do is they say, as a college student, and then they regurgitate whatever essay, or as a high school student, whereas ChatGPT actually changes their word choice, their sentence structure. Um, so they actually do some pretty impressive stuff. So uh, yeah, Bing and Bard are, are tro terrible. I don't know how Bing made ChatGPT4 so broken, but it is it's bad. Um, so then I, my next question, which is, this is brand new, I just did this over the weekend, uh, looking at how the compression um, preset impacts performance. So this is running against every preset. So the lowest preset is almost no compression, so how quickly can you do it? Um, whereas the highest preset is take a long time and essentially, you know, sacrifice output size for time. And you see, not very many differences, actually. Um, you see a little bit in uh, Zlib early on, just because Zlib will use a very small window size, so they won't actually be able to consume and build tokens out of the entire text. Uh, as you build that bigger, then they can do that. And so you see, basically, there's a huge jump from the first level of compression up to the next one. Um, but otherwise, essentially, you're having this constant um, kind of you know thing, or it's not a huge difference. Uh, same thing for um, Brotly, which I don't know if you're familiar, it's an open uh, compression algorithm from Google that's used mostly for web traffic, so for streams. Um, but it's uh, kind of interesting. I'm really curious what happens at uh, preset 10 because it drops off pretty significantly and then it goes back up. But um, just something to see that, you know, the compression algorithm and the compression presets are relatively kind of unnecessary. You're still getting pretty good performance regardless. Uh, so now just a little more practical about the implementation. So not only is this fairly accurate, it's also much faster. So I have a test suite of 80,000 documents of which I choose randomly uh, about 5,000 of them and I run them through all the detectors. So it takes Zippy two minutes and 14 seconds on this laptop to run through all of them. Uh, content at scale takes a whopping eight and a half hours to run on their servers, which are faster than my laptop. Roberta takes an hour and a half on my laptop, which is the, the model. Um, and then some of the other ones that are software as a service also take between one or six and a half hours. So content at scale is very good, but pretty much it takes at least 20 seconds to get back to you for any answer. And so it is something that might be useful for high confidence, like high impact decision making, but not something that you want to use in the field for quick decision making. And so the speed and sm small scalability, I mean, it's 100 and something lines of code and then a 200K text file, which you can leave compressed. Uh, you can then start deploying that into interesting ways and start thinking about what you would have if you had, you know, call it AI noise canceling headphones. If you could, you know, essentially build a little bubble, a little firewall around you that means that only human generated text at the same level of scale is coming into you. Um, and so then I built, there's the command line utility we saw, there's the web based in browser. So it does local in JavaScript in the browser determination. And then I built a web based browser plugin. Um, and then since the model is just a text file, it's trivial to augment, replace. You could go and replace it with ChatGPT generated text in another language, and then it should be able to do that. Or as these models change, you can just highlight the text and say, add this to the model, you're appending to a text file, and now you start to get that improvement immediately. Um, so real quick here. I just hosted this. It's all being done in the browser. Um, I just texted something which was a, uh, I believe, a fake article written about um, Representative Santos. And it says AI generated with text with this level of confidence. So very simple. That's easy. Not that exciting. Um, I think this is kind of cute. Uh, on the left, I have, um, I think that's Chrome. And I have this text. These are the two about me files. On the top is the thing that I wrote. On the bottom is something that ChatGPT wrote. And essentially what you have, I'll play it one more time, is that as this page loads, it goes through every paragraph on a page whenever you're browsing. And then it sets the transparency of that paragraph to the confidence that it was generated by AI. So AI text just fades away and you're left in your nice, happy bubble. Um, 
Actually, right now, the Firefox one is using Zlib, whereas the Chrome is using LZMA. So the LZMA is a little slower, but it's not being done natively in the browser. Um, so I'm kind of comparing between the two. You get a very slight accuracy boost from uh, LZMA, um, but the browser is like 100 times faster. So uh, both of these are available on the Chrome or Firefox web store. Just search for AI noise canceling headphones and you can install them. I've been using it as a daily driver and it's kind of interesting to see like the Verge tech blogs occasionally where they have like a press release from some product it starts to get a little bit fainter than it used to be. Um, so kind of an interesting uh, experience to see the internet change in front of you. A couple of minutes left. So there is kind of a difficult on how you evaluate this, right? And so this is coming back to the more scientific view. The data sets available are spotty. They're not vetted very thoroughly. They're used in a single paper to evaluate their detector, and then they're abandoned. So most of the data sets I found, I was the first person to reuse that data set. They published a paper on archive saying, look at how great our detector is, and then they gave up, and they moved on, and that data set's never been used again. Um, and, you know, getting ground truth for human-generated data of different types is very, very difficult. The landscape is in flux. I've said this. There are entities joining, leaving, um, and then these detectors can change all the time. So you can go and say, well, this detector said your essay was written by ChatGPT. I'm sorry. Can you explain that? And then three days later, you rerun it again, and it says it's human-generated, and now you don't know what to do. Um, and so performing a repeatable, consistent evaluation is very difficult. Few detectors publish their evaluation, they just provide their, their accuracy. Uh, I believe you know, GPT-0 says they're 98% accurate, which I'm sure they have a data set when they run it, they are 98% accurate. Um, I'm sure I could craft an input of by discarding all of the ones that I don't do well on it. I could also be a, almost 100% accurate. Um, so it's very difficult to understand that, and it's very easy to bias the evaluation, even honestly, right? So for me, Zippy only works if the text is somewhat believable. Like if the text is just random noise, it's going to say it's human generated because it's very perplexing because it's never seen random noise before. If you're trying to build a, was this random noise generated by an LLM? I can't help you with that. And so I've biased my evaluation by using text that's English that makes somewhat sense. Um, and then overall, there's just a huge lack of maturity and consensus on how this research field should be measured and evaluated. And there's a lot of marketing, advertising, and, you know, sadly, this project, like the only issues I've gotten other than a few people who have had you run this have been, I work in the marketing department for this other detector. Can you test ours so that we can, you know, basically, and then link to our site. Uh, and so I've become the benchmark. They're usually less happy when I then publish that they're 62% accurate, and then I say, look at that, and it took six and a half hours. They're less keen to then, you know, blog about that. Um, but it is sad that me, some random guy on a random repo, has the most robust evaluation, and that's the bar benchmark that people are using um, for their own products. So, in conclusion, uh, compression seems to be able to do this and even attribute text a lot faster. Um, and determine whether things are LLM or human generated. There is a lot of improvisation in the evaluation space. There's no data set. I mean, you could not publish an academic paper in computer vision without showing your benchmark test on, say, MNIST or CIFAR 100. Like, there are established data sets and evaluation, and you can't say, this is new work and it's better than the rest without publishing against those. Whereas, you can easily charge money for something saying that it is 98% accurate against some data set that we're never going to show you. And again, unless you know and you're evaluating them yourself, you don't know how accurate that might be. And it's very concerning that these are being marketed towards making high consequence decisions. If you're paying for a site that, for example, is determined is a plagiarism detector that also does AI detection, you're probably using it to make a high consequence decision unless you're just randomly curious about whether things are plagiarized or not. And that makes you know huge impact on people if you're talking about academic integrity without the transparency and how that works. And I think that's very concerning. Um, I'd love to collaborate as I have no experience formally with AI or LLMs. I've kind of bumbled into this. Uh, and so if anyone would like to collaborate, I think there's a lot more space here to go. Um, this is all open source on the repo. And I'd be thrilled to talk with you all, 
um, or collaborate um, both at the conference or afterwards. Are there any questions? Yes. Before the questions, maybe let's give Jacob a hand for this. Not, not only did we get a crash course in LLMs, we also got a uh, Jacob multi-threading in his brain while he was talking, wondering if he's changed the name of SIPI to NFT Rex. So, questions? Yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. It was really interesting. I love the simplicity of the approach. That's fun. Uh, it may not work in English, but could we fool the detection by picking synonym word with more entropy? Yeah, so I think for language, uh, if I understand the question, is would it work for other languages? Uh, in fact, you you have a text that is generated by, by a, a generator. Yep. And then you just switch the word from the generator with the word that has the same meaning in the same language, but with the highest entropy, word per word. Yeah, so uh, could you essentially build the next step, which is use a thesaurus on your chat GPT output and say, rather than using the word cold, let's use the word frigid or something that's less likely. Uh, yeah, that could work. Um, chat GPT text is already kind of criticized for being overly formal and kind of... Uh, I don't know if you've read a lot of the output. It's it's kind of uh, you know already using uh, fairly high. Uh, and so the word choice would have to be something very different from what it chose. So it may be the opposite. Maybe you go in and you convert the text from being kind of formal and flowery down to something much more simple, uh, and that could be a way to detect this. Yes, for sure. Up front here, Klaus. <coughs> Great presentation, and I'm so sorry for throwing you off midway. That was my bad. Uh, oh, just so GPT two, G, is that okay? GPT two was like cons consumer release, right? So there was prior art logically, and we don't know about what was not published, right? So since you have a fairly, I mean, this is like sort of one guy making a great effort. That's like super great approach. Very intuitive. If you could scale that, it would be interesting to scan portions of the internet and assess if there was leakage of AI-generated text content like earlier than one might expect. That would be an interesting research project is all I'm saying. Uh, definitely. Um, so I would say that uh, at least from what has been published about GPT, they don't call it GPT-1 because there was no 2 yet, but just general GPT, is that the quality is very poor. Like, you would read that and you'd say either that's someone who is not native at all and doesn't really understand that language um, and doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, or it could be GPT. But I think you're right. Maybe it is interesting to see, looking in that kind of last fall time frame, um, so my detector flags almost all of the OpenAI's ChatGPT announcement blog as AI generated, not just the samples that they show. So I would suspect that you want to demo this thing. You write an announcement blog for yourself, include some examples, and for the most part, most of that blog is it's attributed to the authors of the paper but most of that appears to be generated by an LLM. And so, yeah, I bet there is some interesting tidbits of when that stuff started going back out onto the Internet. Um, and it would be a very interesting uh, kind of experiment to see where that leakage started happening and how early it was out there. If I, if I may respond, it is true that private citizens, we can buy airplanes, but we can't buy F-35s. We buy, like, a Piper Cub, right? So what's commodity is not necessarily all that is in terms of capabilities. And, like, there are nation states which don't value freedom of the press, for example. So I'm saying it's possible that somebody out there was doing some <clears throat> scandalous shit before last fall. That would be an interesting research project. 
Yeah. Uh, again, I'd love to collaborate. And yeah, see, I mean, probably it would be uh, interesting to look at disinformation campaigns targeting the West to see if a lot of that was really human generated uh, manually or if that was automated um, or looking at, you know, other language text to see um, if there is kind of uh, domestic to whatever region that is um, disinformation or scale generation. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you, Jacob. This talk was really cool. Um, what I wanted to ask is, don't you, with your method, run into the same scaling issues that all these uh, like forward pass through LML, LL, LLM detectors have, where you need to get the output of the model first into your, like I say, training document that you attach to it. Um, so if there's like a proliferation, say, of lots of different models, which we're now seeing on, on what Facebook uh, Meta has published, uh, don't you run into the same issue where you can no longer detect uh, AI-generated content because it might be some unique model that someone has uh, dreamt up in their basement? Yeah, so I think there's two answers to that. So in a kind of engineering level, because this is so fast, I already am running it against a model file from all of the big models out there. Um, and the open models like Llama, Vacuna, Alpaca, those are all pretty much the same weights that have been just tweaked ever so slightly as they move around. I think the main thing is that intuition of a large language model that doesn't understand the concepts that it's talking about, as it has been trained in a large data set, is going to have that reversion to the mean that is kind of the key intuition. So. Uh, it's fairly model agnostic. So most of my model has been done with ChatGPT or GPT-3, and yet it still performs very well on Bing and BARD uh, and Vicuna. I think it was like 100% right on Vicuna 7B. So um, I think that unless we see a revolutionary designed model that only focuses on either some type of text generation or understands concepts in a certain domain and then is able to express that, I think that this will work more generally um, just because of that's what happens is it's going to go for that mean based on the language that they have. And they're all using that 45 terabyte common crawl text. Uh, thank you, great presentation, it was great. Uh, I have a question, would it be possible to generalize this this analysis to non-language artifacts, such as images, or... I'm, I'm thinking, especially for art, the higher perplexity would throw the models completely off, as you said before. Would it, would it make sense? Yeah, so I thought about that a lot, um, and so you kind of run into this issue of most models run on tokens, not words, and so there is some inherent compression going on there in getting it into that format. Um, working on, say, an image, I actually would think that'd be really interesting. Say, if you have, you know, a bunch of pictures of, say, a ball, could you do image recognition purely through compression? Um, they did recently have a paper showing that you can do NLP purely through compression. So they're able to match or beat some of these enormous models with gzip, which is not that enormous or not that new. Uh, so I think in the text space, maybe, I think you can start moving into the images. But, you know, for media integrity, um, I knew a little bit about this uh, overlapping with the media forensics program at DARPA. Um, there are a lot of other things that you can look at that are not just you know, statistical trends. So every camera has a unique kind of noise when they build the sensor. So there's either dust or some type of manufacturing variant. So if you take enough pictures from one camera, you can actually fingerprint all images from that camera. Uh, and that's used in law enforcement for tracking all sorts of things. Um, and so if you start seeing, you know, for example, a very sharp change in that noise that's non-uniform, you think maybe that's been copied and pasted. Uh, you start to see some of these things that I think are, uh, again, they're more in the kind of exploiting something that's semantically or syntactically there rather than these broader uh, statistical things. So I don't know. I'd like to try it. That's where I want to go next is seeing if I can use this for a fast image or text classifier. Um, and then maybe seeing if Dolly generated text or images compared to real. Um, 
I haven't got there yet. Thanks. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to the AV guys? Like, they've been kicking it all week. Thanks, guys. I mean, like, you're the IT folks or the IT folks this week. You know what I'm saying? Um, question, sort of suggestion. You fix captures. You want to create a Facebook account? Write a three-paragraph essay. Nobody has to read it. I'm just kidding, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I want to write an essay for every uh, website I sign up for. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. How little also, like, could you go down to the sentence level? Write a sentence about yourself. Could that be something that you'd be able to get a strong enough? Generally speaking, with these types of statistical things, so OpenAI had a minimum 1,000 character uh, before they would even run the detector because at very short inputs, they had no idea. Um, yeah, I don't want to write a thousand character essay every time I go log into a website. Yeah, interesting question. Are we uh, I, out of time? Yeah, we're quite out I, of time. I think any further questions will have to be outside, unfortunately, because we have the next speaker ready. I think. Or oh, don't we? Thank you, Jacob.